Hi, Melanie. Hi, Bob. How are you? I'm doing okay. How are you doing? I cannot complain. Let me introduce us. I'm Robert Wright. This is The Wright Show. You are Melanie Brewster. You are uh, a professor of psychology and education at Teachers College of Columbia University. And in fact, you're literally right across the street from me right now because I'm at Union Theological Seminary where I'm a visiting professor of science and religion. Um, and you also co-founded the Sexuality, Women, and Gender Project, but perhaps more important for our purposes today, um, first of all, you are an atheist, but secondly, you've edited this book, Atheists in America, published by uh, Columbia University Press, uh, which is a kind of compilation of uh, kind of testimonies by atheists about the experience of being atheist in America. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, one recurring theme in here is the idea of kind of, of coming out. That's a phrase, coming out as an atheist. And that may surprise some of us, because I think in my kind of social milieu, uh, I assume most of my friends are probably either atheist or agnostic. And I think it would, in my particular milieu, it would probably take more courage to say, you know, to stand up and say, I'm a Christian and I believe Jesus died for our sins and so on, um, then, then to say, I mean, maybe not in this immediate milieu at Union Theological Seminary, although even here you have quite a range of <laughs> theological views, and, you, and we have atheist students, in fact. But, um, uh, but still, you know what I mean? You've probably heard this from people, because you are, you know, you, you, are, you hang out in academic circles uh, where there's, mm -hmm. there are no few atheists and agnostics. Um, but I gather this is a real thing, that a lot of people are kind of quietly atheist somewhere in America uh, for fear of, mm -hmm. of revealing their actual beliefs. Yeah, it's an interesting contrast, too, because um, I teach master's and doctoral level students at Teachers College. And I, do, I have noticed that there's a real contrast now um, in New York City where I think our Christian and like believing students do feel like they're a marginalized mm -hmm. group um, in academia, but that's such a stark contrast from any other place that I've taught or worked. Um, so as like an illustration, I, um, I've taught in Utah, I've also taught at the University of Florida, and when I was in grad school at the University of Florida, even for me, which I was in a psychology department, it was a really big deal and really controversial to actually say that you're atheist. Really? Um, yeah. In an actual yeah. psychology department at a major university. Yeah, I mean, one of my clearest um, recollections is we, I was in a career counseling class and we were talking about um, something called learned ha happenstance theory, which, is, which essentially says, like, you're going to get a job or a career based on a number of events in the universe that you don't have a lot of control over. So you should kind of just let go, let God go with the flow. Mm -hmm. And I was having a real reaction to that as a non-believer because I'm like, what do you mean trust in the universe? Like, that's not going to be helpful for me if a therapist says that. And so in that class, I came out as atheist. And a lot of people in the classroom um, kind of looked at me aghast and they're like, but you're so, you're so nice. What do you mean you're atheist? And I think that that was a real eye-opener for me because I was like, well, I guess it's not okay to be atheist and atheists are perceived somehow as not friendly, not nice, more adversarial. And so because I, I am friendly, I am not adversarial typically, they wouldn't recognize me as one. Mm -hmm. And had you already, like growing up, had there been a, a moment where you, I mean, were you brought up religiously? Was it an issue with your family or how, how did it play out? Um, and so my mother identified pretty strongly as United Methodist while I was growing up. My this is where? Father, what part of the country? This was in Miami, okay. Florida. And um, her parents, her dad was Catholic. Her mom is also a Methodist. Um, they went to church. She was pretty religious. I think that particularly being an only child, they really felt a, a strong pressure to instill some sort of religious belief mm -hmm. on me because I think a lot of parents feel like, you know, pass on the moral fiber, but religion never really stuck. Like I remember having pretty animated fights with both of my parents on the way home from, from church. I would ask them lots of questions about it. So I think 
within the family system, at least my immediate family, I had always been pretty outspoken as an atheist. Um, but there was always, and I think you hear about this a lot um, in, in like the blogosphere of atheist, um, there's a don't tell grandma phenomenon. Mm-hmm. So I think that openness didn't persist outside of my, my parents themselves. Okay. My mom herself is now atheist, so I argued her out of religion. Oh, did you really? You feel guilty? <laughs> You know, slightly, I have to, I feel like, especially for older adults, if you're not connected with um, a religious or spiritual community in some of the parts of the South, like there really isn't a lot out there for you. So I wonder how that's going to be as she gets older. You know, it's funny, when I was in high school, this is in San Antonio, Texas, I actually, I think, identified as atheist. And I mean, now I actually would call myself more like an agnostic who's kind of spiritually inclined in some carefully defined sense. But, um, uh, but you know, I don't remember it being a big deal. I mean, I'm sure it varies from community to community, but San Antonio is a pretty conservative area, very military kind of influenced city. You know, this was what would have been called middle class, maybe upper middle class, not by today's standards, but by those. But it's it's odd that I think I kind of almost enjoy. I mean, it was it was it was a distinctive identity. There weren't a lot of people saying that, but I kind of liked that. And uh, uh, but but I wasn't I, I didn't suffer for it socially. I don't think. I mean, do you, uh, here's a question: Did you get a sense in 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 all your research, including uh, this book, of like what kind of social factors uh, determine whether a community is going to be particularly hostile. It's kind of, you know, big city versus small town. I'm, cert- I'm sure it's part of the country. I mean, to some extent, it's like there's a difference between the Northeast and the Midwest and the, mm-hmm. and the South. But what, what would you say are the main things that are going to be predictors of how hard it's going to be to be an atheist in a neighborhood or a, or a city or whatever? I mean, I think some of the obvious ones are definitely true. So there are people in the, the book that identify as LDS or Mormon And they had a particularly hard time because when your community is so homogenous in terms of religiosity, I think that's an affront not just on people's belief systems, but also their culture, um, how they spend the majority of their social activities. Um, There are also people who were more from like the Bible Belt. Again, I think church culture is so huge there that if you say you're a non-believer, people really don't know what to do with you because already they feel like they might have nothing in common with you or they're going to distrust you more. But I think what, what I find even in the Northeast and um, what people kind of report in larger, more metropolitan areas that have like more secular people is that a lot of people are out as, well, I'm not very religious or, you know, I'm spiritual, but not religious. And that's kind of a way that they avoid stigma related to being atheist, Mm -hmm. because I think there's something much safer about um, saying, you know, while I do believe in something, Mm -hmm. it's not like I don't believe in anything that's more palpable. Mm -hmm. Um, So I feel like a lot of people, even in New York City, don't actually say I'm atheist, Mm -hmm. like capital A atheist. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you found that too, or... Um. Let's see. Have I found that? Well, I don't know, because when people say that, I don't know whether they are covertly atheists or not. A lot of people say I'm spiritual, but not religious. And I guess I've taken them at their word. So do you think it's important that atheists come out, so to speak? I mean, do you think it's a it's it's kind of a problem for for the atheists who who are out there that more people who share their worldview aren't being candid about it? Would your, would your life be better, for example, if there were more atheists out there saying, yes, I'm an atheist? I think there are a lot of um, tensions and conflicts between religious and highly spiritual folks that um, would be more readily addressed if there were more kind of open atheists around. Because I think that Religion is given a lot of passes when it comes to stances that that hurt minority groups and marginalized groups. Um, and in some ways, if there are more people that said, "Hey, that I don't associate that with these beliefs. I don't identify in this way. I actually don't believe in anything," um, then in some ways you could band together and actually take on groups that have these discriminatory stances mm-hmm. um, in a way that I think 
when we tiptoe around actually identifying as atheists, we're not able to do that. I don't know if that makes full sense, but... Yeah. Um, so is, then, is atheism a source of community? I mean, you, 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 you ask in, in, your, uh, in the introduction to this, to this book, which is very informative, um, you ask the question, is atheism an identity in the sense that like being Methodist is, being Irish is? Uh, so, I mean, first of all, what, what's your kind of answer to that question? And relatedly is, um, do you observe atheism being a kind of a bond among people, a source of actual community, atheists hanging out with atheists and, and, and getting something out of it? It's, you know, I think it varies so widely depending on where you are. I think being in New York City, um, I have not found that to be the case where there isn't, you know, this active, vibrant atheist community. I mean, you have places like um, ethical culture and there's New York City atheists, which I think are very vocal and active and put on conferences and stuff. But for the most part, like we started off talking about, a lot of people are non-believers, so you don't necessarily need to band together. But I think that in other parts of the U.S., for example, when I was in grad school in Gainesville, Florida, you really did need to look hard for other people that were, were out. And I think when you see more churches than Starbucks in the town that you live in, you do feel like this, this pressure um, mm -hmm. that you should believe that you're missing out on stuff if you're not connected to a religious community. So in that way, I think having a non-believing community is quite helpful and can be really affirming for people. Um, whether or not it's an identity itself, I think is something that I'm still grappling with. Um, and most of that comes from pressure within the quote atheist community, whatever that is, because I think a lot of people um, have a knee jerk reaction to say that it's not an identity, like non-belief itself isn't a defining characteristic. Non-believers mm -hmm. look very different. But I think the same thing could be argued for believing groups. Like not all Christians have the same interest and values. They're going to be quite diverse too. So that in itself doesn't seem like it should be an argument for why it's not an identity. Um, so I think it's, yeah, it's very tricky mm -hmm. to parse it. Have you had any experience with things that are atheist and styling themselves kind of as churches? Uh, there's, I mean, there's a Sunday assembly Mm -hmm. uh, there's uh, the School of Life, which is a little different, uh, but you probably know of it, the Alain de Baton thing in, in England. I, I've read his book. I haven't actually... Yeah. Do they have a brick-and-mortar thing that they do? Um, I don't know if it's... They have, like, uh, I think kind of like weekends and retreats where mm -hmm. you'll go and hear talks by different people, and you pay money for them, uh, for some of them at least. It's like a revenue-generating thing. Um, they have videos online. Then Sunday assembly is a little more like a church uh, mm -hmm. where they, you know, assemble on Sundays. And uh, I actually gave a talk at one in, in uh, San Jose in Silicon Valley not that long ago. Um, demographically, it reminded me of Unitarians, basically, except with better music and, yeah. and, uh, and, uh, and less, you know, less, uh, you know, kind of uh, Christian heritage in terms of the kind of aesthetic context, although Unitarians by and large do not believe in God. Mm -hmm. um, and it was a, you know, they, they, they uh, you know, there seemed to be real fellowship and, and, uh, and, and, you know, that's such an important part of historically of religion, you know, and I think they've done these studies that when they find that like religious people are more likely to do various good things like uh, give to charity, I think what they generally find is that the key variable isn't actual belief in God. It's going to a church. It's go, yeah. being part of a community that emphasizes this particular value. Um, so I, I, I guess I'm, one thing I'm asking is, is there, do you feel, uh, I mean, you, I gather you don't participate in anything like a Sunday assembly. Do you feel that that's a, any kind of void in your life? I mean, would you like to have something church-like in principle? Um, yeah, I mean, I've, I've investigated Sunday Assembly here. I spoke for them a couple months, maybe more, more than a couple months ago, maybe more like three or four months. Um, and I, I felt like a lot of the things that frustrated me about church were replicated there. And that's one of the, the things that I've found other people reacting to as well. Like this idea that you, you sing a song and you hear a message and the message doesn't necessarily go deep 
or have evidence behind it. And like the, the academic in me is like, what do you mean you need to, uh, I don't know, share values and be nice to each other. And Mm -hmm. like, it just felt like it wasn't, um, challenging enough in a way that you would expect a room full of skeptics or atheists to be like, it felt too light. Um, but that being said, I think that every aspect of my life is essentially um, shared with non-believers, like my book club, like my social circle. So I think if that wasn't there, I'd certainly want that and I would miss that. Mm-hmm. Um, I, when I lived in Utah for a year, that was really challenging because you had to kind of monitor what, what you say and how you respond to things. Um, but at least from from in writing Atheist America and talking to people across different parts of the the country, like these communities are very meaningful, especially to older adults. Mm -hmm. Um, I was thinking back on uh, Pam Zerba, who's from Pennsylvania, and she wrote about being involved in a skeptical community there. And this idea that she can just show up and be open and be completely herself and share recipes and, but just not have that filter. Mm -hmm. um, She found very affirming, I think. Yeah. I mean, I think as for the kind of sermon, so to speak, at these places, it seems like some of them emphasize uh, some, I think in some cases at these uh, Sunday assemblies, they are kind of like lectures. They are like they're about science or something. And in those cases, the theme tends to be wonder. You know, that's a big word in kind of, you know, Richard Dawkins, he he gets the equivalent of religion out of one, you know, the wonder of the way the universe Mm -hmm. works, the the marvels of of, of scientific discovery. Um, So I think sometimes there's not the kind of moral exhortation, in which case the question of how well-founded it is doesn't arise. But then I guess the question does arise is how inspiring is it? I mean, how much, how, 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 how long can science continue to, to inspire you? Do do you, I mean, I, I, do you, does wonder, you know, if people ask you, well, what, where are the parts of your life that correspond to certain parts of religion? Like, awe, like, like hope, like consolation in times of suffering, consolation when you're thinking about death, whatever. Um, are these questions you have trouble answering? I mean, I mean, are there, are there, are there in some cases answers that you consider too simple, but you kind of half wish you could settle for them? I wish I could say yes, but honestly, I think the answer is, is no. Like I, I feel very satisfied with a lot of the, the tenets of existentialism in that I feel very much like what the time we have is now. And I think about that every day when I wake up and multiple times throughout the day. And it, I feel like it motivates me to not take anything for granted. Um, Mm -hmm. and so I feel kind of, especially as a, a former counselor and a a therapist who trains therapists, like, I think there's something really valuable to having that, that present sense of your own mortality. Like, Mm -hmm. and there are a lot of things that I, I feel like I might not do unless I was constantly thinking about that. And, you know, at times it can be anxiety provoking as these things go, but, um, I don't really want to superimpose any other explanation on that I can't back up because I think that might make me be lazy. Mm-hmm. Okay. And what about this wonder thing, this awe and wonder thing? Do you, do you get a lot of that? Do you consider it some kind of, you know, counterpart to religious experience or analog of religious experience? Well, I think this is going to be a common response among um, non-believers, but in nature, I feel it a lot. I, I enjoy hiking. Um, I think there are moments of connection with other people where you're having this conversation. You really feel like you're on the same page as somebody and um, you can deeply know them in those moments. Like I feel very inspired and awe in, in those sorts of things. Um, but I think that it's not necessarily, it doesn't need to be tied to anything religious or spiritual for me to feel that. Mm-hmm. Okay. So um, talk about the book a little, the um, you know, you divide it into uh, parts uh, subject headings like family life and atheist parroting, atheism at work, and so on. Um, talk about what you what you learned about some of these. Um, I mean, I mean, are the things that surprised you, you? You must have learned some stuff in pouring over these stories and eliciting them. And how did you? Did you? How did you? First of all, how did you get the stories? 
from the from the people? Um, so I, I put out calls across various social media networks for atheist and agnostic people. Um, things that are as obscurely used as like Yahoo groups to Twitter, Facebook. Um, this is before Tumblr was really at its peak, um, but I would have put it on Tumblr. And then I got quite lucky because um, for some reason Sam Harris retweeted it. And I would say a lot of the, the narratives that came in were probably a direct result of that. Mm -hmm. um, it just takes one person to advertise and support you in that way. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, it's probably a couple hundred submissions came in and then it was just reading through them and grouping them thematically. I had a list of, of some of the areas that I wanted people to touch on. So I think some of them naturally clustered along those lines. And that came out of a real desire to see more diversity in, in stories about atheism. I think, um, historically there's been a lot of the pressure to come out, um, from kind of older white men. You think about people like Dawkins, he had the out campaign with the scarlet letter A, like really saying, come out, remove the scarlet letter of atheism. Um, and, and I he think, had a website where people could declare that they were atheists. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that was successful, although it didn't necessarily fit for more diverse groups where, for example, in the African-American community, churches are a core part of connecting and having a kind of a shelter from racism. So I wanted to get these other narratives from other groups to see if their coming out experiences were similar, um, if not how they diverged. So that was the real push behind um, making sure that this book was not just a replication of other um, stories of, of white men coming out and what mm -hmm. that looked like. And what's, what's like a story or two that you found particularly arresting or surprising or, or telling about the, the predicament of atheists in America? Well, I think um, Cora Judd, who identified as LDS, just being able to that's, step... That's Mormon, right? Mormon, yeah. Right. Um, just being able to kind of step into how much being Mormon influenced every single dimension of her life and how much really discovering that you didn't believe in any of that was just a bomb on her life. Mm -hmm. So everybody that you knew from church, you could no longer really associate with marriages and family became much more complicated because when you identify as Mormon, you have this idea of the eternal family. And if you're not a believer, not only might your um, relationships in, you know, everyday life be troubled, but they believe they're not going to see you in the afterlife, which is of course a huge deal. So I think seeing that depicted for somebody who was living in New York like me and realizing just how traumatic that could be um, was eye-opening in a lot mm -hmm. of ways. Mm -hmm. um, and in some cases, the, the, the issue of coming out intersects with... A, with or coincides with another identity that can involve coming out. Yeah. Like that must get <laughs> complicated. Yeah. Like the, the double closet. When I was, when I was talking to Columbia university press, I actually wanted to call this book, the other closet. And they're like, mm -hmm. no, it'd be too that, on the that's, nose. That's what you call the introduction. Right. I did. I was like, I'm going right. to sneak it in somewhere. Um, but I, I think um, particularly for people who are members of the LGBTQ community coming out, um, often overlaps or intersects with that process in a really significant way, um, especially when, when you identify as queer and a lot of your messages of, of heterosexism, of non-acceptance, have come from religious communities. Mm -hmm. It in some ways goes hand in hand when you're discovering your sexuality or your gender identity that you would start to question or doubt the institutions that have told you that you're wrong or that you're evil or that you're immoral. So... I think more research really needs to be done to look into these kind of parallel paths of coming out in that way and also familial reactions. One of my favorite, um, my favorite reactions, I think it was Stephen, I'm blanking on his last name right now, um, but, but Stephen who wrote an essay for this book talks about how his family was so worried that he was going to come out as atheist when he came out as gay because he sat them down and he's like, I need to tell you something. And they're like, okay, at least you're not atheist. And that's really that, yeah. was their, that was their order of preference. That, that was their reaction. They're that's like, oh, interesting. You thought you were going to tell us you were atheist, which of course he is. And later he would. 
But, so, so, so at least you believe you're going to hell for being gay, right? No. I, I, how, do you know how the, how liberal their their religion was in uh, in this case? I think they were pretty religious, though I don't remember off the top of my head um, which Christian denomination they were a part of. But uh-huh. um, I'm not sure. Yeah. Huh. But that was something that I I actually encountered quite a bit when I was doing counseling in Utah. I ran a lot of support groups for people who identified as LGBTQ. And they would say that they were in some ways more afraid of coming out as not LDS or not a believer as they were as coming out as gay to their family. Mm -hmm. Um, Because at least, at least if you come out as gay, like there's some sort of framework for it. You can still believe that your child's going to go to heaven and they can still um, have some sort of commitment or ritual to honor their relationships, even if they're gay relationships in a church, but if you come out as atheist, a lot of those frames that parents have for their children seem completely shattered. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I've noticed with uh, parents who have gay kids, there can be a dynamic where parents who were formerly very conservative on social issues become liberal by mm-hmm. virtue of identifying with their child. I mean, I uh, actually um, know of people who's politics have just been transformed across the board by this. I mean, they, they are now liberal Democrats, so far as I can tell, because they had a gay son. Mm-hmm. Um, do you find a comparable kind of, are, are, are there at least stories in your book of comparable um, dynamics where the parents' degree of tolerance in a broader sense changes because they, they, they have a child who comes out as atheist? I mean, you said in your case, you, you actually converted your mother. That's, I guess, an extreme case. <laughs> But are, uh-huh. there, are there examples from the book of this kind of thing or from your elsewhere in your experience? You know, there are a couple of stories where people have come out to their parents and they expected them to react quite poorly and their parents were affirming. I don't think there, there were stories where the parents themselves became non-believers. And there were certainly stories where, um, like Ronell Adams, um, who identifies as an African-American man in the South, his mother actually has stopped talking to him completely from when he came out. So that's kind of, I think, the more typical example that you would see if families are quite, quite conservative Christian. Um, But then again, yeah, I mean, I do have my mother as an example. And I think when somebody that you care about as deeply as a child says, I don't believe in this and here's why, and a parent still sees that they're a good person, um, it's hard for them to think, oh, you're going to go to hell and you're completely wrong for believing that. I think in the same way, the parallel process where if you have a a son or a daughter who comes out as gay or lesbian, um, it's hard for you to kind of cast aside everything that you feel about them and then wholeheartedly think that they're evil or wrong. Like you just, Mm -hmm. you can't really hold both of those things most Mm -hmm. of the time. Okay. There's a term I hadn't seen before that I saw in the introduction to your book. It's atheophobia. Yeah. Uh, is that is that commonly used in kind of the atheist community now? You're you're you're, tr- you're trying to give it legs. <laughs> well, it was um, it was the first kind of word that I had seen that captured a parallel to homophobia, and mm-hmm. it was it was coined by Robert Nash. And so I'm like, well, you know, maybe since somebody has already written about this, I should use it. But it's not really something that stuck. I think because it sounds like arachnophobia, and it's just such a clunky word. Yeah. <laughs> It but kind largely. Of, but it's but it's a thing, right? I mean, I mean, uh, and, and what what forms does it take? I mean, what are the forms of blowback that people? We've alluded to some of them, but what what would you say the most common forms of social blowback people get from being atheist? Well, I mean, um, a project that I'm doing now that's that's in revise and resubmit for the millionth time um, is on atheist discrimination and different dimensions of it, and I think that. Um, It takes a few different forms, but typically it's kind of this more subtle social exclusion, social isolation, feeling like people are talking about you or don't trust Mm -hmm. you. Um, Then there's like a very common dimension that you see written about a lot, um, which is this perception that atheist people are more immoral. Um, So they don't know the difference between right or wrong. Um, They're going to hell. They're not trustworthy. They're just contrary. And I think another dimension that isn't talked about quite as much but is still important 
is kind of the microaggressive experiences that you encounter as an atheist, particularly in the South, where people still insist that, well, you are religious, you're just angry at God, um, or you, you should still go to church because then you'll really, you know, find your religious beliefs again. So there's a real kind of doubt or skepticism about the validity of your beliefs for, mm -hmm. for many atheists and a real pressure to either conceal your beliefs or um, to just cast them aside completely and kind of come back into the fold. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, is this, you know, one thing I've observed, you, you talk about the new atheists in the introduction, and I want to talk about them a little. Um, and for people who don't know, I mean, they're the, I guess, the kind of newly outspoken atheists, you might say. I mean, I think 20, 30 years ago, atheists, well, for one thing, were less likely to, to even say that they were atheists, but certainly less likely to kind of shout it the way the new atheists do. Um, you know, Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris, and mm -hmm. so on. Uh, one thing I've noticed is that their, some of their followers are really ardent. I mean, I, I debated Sam Harris in Los Angeles. It, it was, this was, wasn't about theism. It was about, it was about kind of the new atheism. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, uh, I mean, these are like, I, I mean, uh, I'm not the first to make the comparison to a religious following. I mean, these are, it is tribal and they are intense. They it's are. kind of like, it's kind of like fans of a rock star or, but it's super intense. And I'm wondering why, what, what, what you think the intensity grows out of? I mean, I, I, I have some ideas about that myself and part mm -hmm. of them are, are from, from kind of from your book, but what would you say? <sighs> I mean, I feel like they're only getting more intense, too. I, really? I would have expected that it would have... I think the height was after 9-11, mm -hmm. um, and then... But it's still kind of just continued. I, I mean, I think a lot of it comes from years and years of built-up resentment uh, of the power that religious institutions have, um, the power to oppress, the power to uh, not have to really deal with, with taxes and things like that. Um, the, the power to influence everything from what's on the currency to what you say when somebody sneezes. Like, I think all of this, this stuff just has made people angry. And mm -hmm. I think particularly um, watching how these institutions have oppressed certain minority groups has been very eye-opening um, and initially caused some of the, the fervor within new atheist groups. However, now I'm not sure where that's still coming from. Because I think that many atheist people have come out and we we are more active and more vocal and more open. Um, so why there's still so much um, like anger and hatred and need to really uh, like prove that you're the most, a most atheist, I don't know where that's coming from at this point. Yeah, it's interesting. Um Somebody who was associated with what was then the Richard Dawkins Foundation, I think that's now merging with something else. But, CFI. Uh, yeah, with the Center for Inquiry. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, but somebody in Los Angeles who was uh, maybe running it, but, but told me that a lot of it comes from people who think they were damaged by religious upbringing. Like mm -hmm. they had, I guess, particularly intense parents or whatever. Um, but, but people who feel... Uh, and I wouldn't have guessed that, but that's that's what he said. I mean, even that doesn't. Well, I guess maybe that ex could explain why it would persist. But uh, but it is a real phenomenon. Um, now, you in discussing the new atheists, you, I guess you might say, seem to be agnostic on the new atheists, or at least that's kind of the stance you take in the in the book. Do you think, or do you hear from other people that? Um, there's a danger that the kind of confrontational attitude of the new atheists actually increases atheophobia rather than the other way around. Yes, and yes. Um, I think I'm agnostic towards the new atheists, not because I don't necessarily believe in their mission. I think, for the most part, a lot of what I think about religion and spirituality, not spirituality, but religious institution does line up with that, their beliefs, but I think some of the the mouthpieces of the new atheism are just so 
confrontational and so aggressive um, and in some ways not in favor of diversity at all, diversity of beliefs, diversity in terms of race, gender, within the atheist community that it's hard to say that they're really doing any good for an atheist mm-hmm. community when they're so off-putting. And I do think that I'm a little bit saddened by the fact that people such as Richard Dawkins, who is a brilliant scientist, but who has said so many terrible things on Twitter, on the internet, that I think he's... You mean about Muslims or... Muslim people, women, women who defend Muslims. Like, it's just, there's there's a whole mess of of things that he said that I think um, make atheists in general, because when people imagine atheists, they imagine Richard Dawkins seem like contrary Islamophobic people. <laughs> and we're not, I think for the most part, we're not, but that's what people imagine. Yeah. Um, and you mentioned diversity and so you're talking partly about the fact, I guess, that the people identified as the new atheists tend to be white males. All, I uh, mean, all of them. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there's, there's what, I guess, now between four and eight, depending how, on how you, you know, uh, who, who come to mind. And, and they all fit that description. Beyond that, on the gender front, there there's been some kind of accusations of misogyny. Um, but I can't, t- to me, that doesn't seem to kind of follow naturally from the ideology. I mean, for example, I would say that there is among some of them a kind of a right-wing tilt, I think, on foreign policy. Mm -hmm. And that, I see how that flows from the ideology in the sense that one thing the new atheists believe that traditionally atheists haven't necessarily believed and don't need to believe is that religion on balance does more harm than good. Mm -hmm. That's an empirical question. I don't think any of them have actually looked closely and carefully at the evidence. But anyway, that's their belief, and they tend to ascribe problems in the world that involve religious people who cite their religion, they tend to ascribe those to religion. So Richard Dawkins said the Israel-Palestine thing is a product of religion and so on. And, and if you believe that, if you believe that, it's, that religion is the prime mover of conflict, then you're not inclined to look in the cir- at the circumstances on the ground that give rise to the grievances that give rise to the violence. And of course, that's mm-hmm. kind of a right-wing position to not want to hear about grievances of people who are you know, living in occupied territory, or whatever. So right. I get that. I get the at least logical connection between their premises, which I take, I take issue with, but, and their, their kind of political ideology. In the case of misogyny, I don't get it. And, and I'm wondering, in your view, is it connected to their kind of the new atheist doctrines? Or is it just a couple of male atheists have kind of misbehaved or said things they shouldn't have said or what? It's, that's such an interesting question. Um, I think it's mostly that a couple of people have very outspoken views. But I do think that there's a connection there in feeling that religion is the ultimate evil and the ultimate oppressor, particularly um, Islam. And Mm -hmm. I think that some of these more prominent atheists have looked at how um, women are treated in the Muslim world and what they're subjected to. And then when they hear um, feminists bring up things like equal pay, things like sexism, things like objectification that they encounter in their day-to-day lives in the U.S., their response has often been, don't be a whiner, look at the Muslim world, women in the U.S. and other Western countries have it so good. And I think that, yes, we do have it better, but, like, why the comparison? Like, things can always get better across groups. And so I think that that has felt really diminishing of women's experiences here, especially women in the the atheist community that are totally on board with the way that Muslim women are treated needs to be, you know, revised. And it's not like we're saying that's, that's okay. So it's, it's confusing. Well, the famous case was when a woman, I guess, kind of an atheist convention or something, recounted an incident where she was in an elevator with a guy and she found it kind of creepy. He, what he said something about, I don't know, it was, Hey, I liked your talk and maybe we should, would you like to have a drink or whatever he said, yeah. it seemed particularly threatening given that they were the only two people in a very small enclosed space that there was no exit from. Right. And, and, and it, that seemed to me like I can see, uh, you know, that seems like a reasonable thing to say was creepy. 
But Dawkins just like went off. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, it just like berated her for not spending all of her time thinking about oppressed Muslim women. I mean, we're like as if Richard Dawkins doesn't complain <laughs> <laughs> about things he sees uh-huh. as as unpleasant or in some sense oppressive. But uh, that, anyway, that was the famous example there. Yeah. And I guess that kind of typifies what you're you're talking about. And then there's there have been other anecdotal things. Um, so uh, but anyway, it's. Uh, the, I mean, the other, the related area where there's kind of an ideological tenor, I think the new atheism is what is being cast by some people as a free speech issue on campus, okay? And there's contention over whether it even is a free speech issue. So, for example, at Yale, when they, uh, there was the issue of, you know, it, it, it's, it's on, on the right, it's called kind of hyper-political correctness and, uh, and infringement of free speech to kind of to kind of really forcefully discourage certain ways of talking about whatever indigenous people or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. My sense is that the new atheists kind of line up on what's identified as the conservative side of that to the extent that they, is that, is that your impression or am I imagining that? That is my impression too. Um, And I think some of that has been in reaction to um, critiques of feminists and people of color for some of the things the new atheists have said, like Dawkins himself has said that he feels muzzled by people that are so politically correct. But in terms of where, where campus goes, um, the things that new atheists have tended to, to say is that, you know, when you say that students should have to filter how they engage with each other on campus or administrators say you can't have racist parties where people dress up like, like Africans and zebras, um, that that's filtering people's ability to to have free speech, and like we shouldn't do that under any circumstances. But mm-hmm. I think what they're they're losing that position is a whole mess of psychological research and evidence that shows that when you are in a microaggressive culture and you are experiencing other people negating your culture, um, kind of poo pooing your identity and core aspects of yourself that that is linked to psychological distress. So when they're like, no, it doesn't matter. Just just don't go to those parties if you don't like them. If you even see that there is a party that is where you dress up like tribal members or it's going to be an, an affront to you if you identify as an indigenous person or it's just mm-hmm. they're ignoring evidence. And as skeptics, they shouldn't ignore evidence that these things are real. And, and there may be students who come to college and genuinely don't realize that they may offend someone if they dress mm-hmm. up in a certain way. And the, the Yale memo that, that started that particular controversy, you know, was to some extent just, just a reminder for students who maybe had never known a Native American that, you know, if you just kind of dress up as a Native American, uh, yeah. you know, like that, you know, and, 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 and I can well imagine that, that, even at Yale, there would be some students, 18-year-olds come in from, you know, somewhere uh, and just haven't thought about it. Yeah. Um, so anyway, that, that was that. Um, there's a, uh, there's something you, you've, you've written about, uh, about the, in your view, atheists are understudied in various ways, including in your own discipline of psychology, right? Is that, so you actually did research, I think. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and documented this. What did you find? Um, I mean, the the take home message was this was a content analysis of, of research across all social science disciplines. I looked at it from the year 2000 to 2012. And there were 100 empirical articles that were entirely focused on atheism, that the topic was atheism or included a large enough sample that you could say something substantive about atheist people. Um, And for me, when you think about psychology, when you think about the fact that probably 7 to 15 percent of the population is atheist, that's really scary because how do we know how to work with atheist clients when they come into counseling? Um, How do we talk about bereavement and rituals around um, like changes in life and developmental stages if we don't actually understand the specific experiences of atheist people? Um, And it's really confusing to me why that persists. I think now there's a stronghold of a few um, largely atheists themselves, psychological researchers that are starting to remedy this. But I I feel like it's going to take a lot of undoing to counter how little 
research there is. Mm -hmm. I guess, um, I mean, I can imagine one thing psychologists might say is that, I, I mean, I think one thing you show is that there's just a lot more study of religious psychology, right, mm -hmm. than of atheist psychology. Yeah. And so I, I assume, perhaps wrongly, that psychologists tend to be closer to the agnostic, or academic psychologists tend to be closer to the agnostic atheist end of the spectrum. So to them, the strange thing is religious belief. That's kind of the exotic thing that is awaiting investigation. You know, in other words, to them, not believing in God is not the surprising thing. That that's, doesn't need any explanation or, or illumination. Is that, do people ever say this or is that, is that, does that not make sense to you? It makes sense, but that doesn't explain why so many psychologists then look at how religious beliefs and spiritual beliefs relate to things like self-esteem and well-being and psychological distress, because I don't know why they wouldn't be curious about how their own non-belief is related to those things, too. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel like there's been a real shift, because if you look at like the early psychologists, Freud, and then later with CBT and REBT, people like Albert Ellis, they were pretty outspoken about religion and thinking hmm. that it wasn't that positive for hmm. psychological health. Hmm. Um, but then I think when you see the rise of people like, um, oh my gosh, I'm forgetting his name, Alan Bergen, I believe, who did work on how religiosity is a predictor of mental health, and then hundreds and hundreds of studies that supported this trend, I think largely because when you're religious, you have a community for the most part, like we were talking about earlier. I think it then became taboo to challenge that and to say, well, what about non-believers? Can't they have mental health too? Um, so it became this, this unspoken understanding that more religious equals more psychologically healthy, that that was a core dimension of well-being in a way that I think is being troubled finally, but it hasn't been for a long time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, well, thank you for taking the time. Anything else you want to say about the book or, um, or, 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 how, how, or reactions to it you're getting or uh, anything I at mean, all? I think, it's, I think it's friendly enough to give to your religious uncle. Like, yeah, no, no, it is. I mean, it, it, it's, it has a couple of virtues. It, it's the stories told by people which goes down a lot more easily than, say, the contents of a typical academic book. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, you can read it in bits and pieces because, because of, you know, it's a lot of people telling their stories. It's not like uh, you have to decide that you're going to read all however many pages, 250 pages. So it's a good, it's a good gift book. Yeah, yeah. Um, it perhaps for religious holidays. <laughs> I know, I told my family, you're all getting that for Christmas, but <laughs> they didn't. By the way, uh, the th one eye-opener for me in your introduction was I didn't realize how many laws are in the books. Like in Mississippi, it's, it's still illegal to hold state office if you don't believe in a, in a supreme being. They have it on the books, but you can't enforce it. You can't. The courts have deemed that you can't enforce it. It's, I mean, it's against the protection of religious freedom to actually uh -huh. enforce that at this point. But they still have it there. And I think that keeping that historical artifact... Mm -hmm where you can still point to it and maybe a judge won't challenge it is troubling in itself. Okay. So you yeah. can run for office in Mississippi then, should you decide. If you, you, you would probably... You personally, I mean, you, you have that career option. I, I could. I could be a Mississippi politician yes. and potentially. <laughs> I, but I'm not optimistic. <laughs> no. <laughs> about uh, how you do in the election. Um, <laughs> probably not. Okay. Well, 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 thanks again, Melanie, for taking Thank the time. Thank you so much. Fun. It was good to talk to you. Same here. Okay, bye.